Good morning, everyone, and welcome to University Unitarian Church in Seattle, Washington. It's Sunday, October 4th, 2020, and my name is John Luopa, and I'm the senior minister here, and I'm here this morning with my good colleague, Beth Cronister, our very able music staff, Dwight Beckmeyer on piano, and Kelly Lindenmeyer, who was our soloist this morning, together with our dynamic duo tech team, David and Byron. It is good to be together with you this morning, even if it's just a virtual way. We hope that you are doing well in these difficult times. We understand that the daily news is hard to bear and seems cumulative day after day, week after week. Together with our own personal struggles and challenges, it can be quite tough. So if we can help you in any way, I would advise you to reach out to either of the ministers, myself or Beth, uh, by email, uh, so that we might uh, companion you, support you in the best ways that we can. Let us begin the service this morning. Isn't that great to see our bell choir playing again together? I call us to worship this morning with these words. We wake, we rise, we rise up. We come together bringing with us our joys and sorrows, our compassion and the limits of it, our truths and our unknowing, our strengths and our shortcomings, all held all held without question or caveat in the loving and unending embrace of the holy, the one who calls us by our true name, beloved. Welcome to worship this morning, beloveds. Welcome to University Unitarian Church. From wherever you are, it is good to be together. Would you please join me now in singing our doxology, followed by him number 128, for all that is our life. that 
tis our life, we sing our thanks and praise for all life is a gift which we are called to use to build the common good and make our own days glad. For needs which others serve, for services we give, for work and its rewards, for hours of rest and love, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, for sorrow we must bear, for failures, pain, and loss, for each new thing we learn, for fearful hours that pass, we come with praise and thanks. For all that is our life, for all that is our life, we sing our thanks and praise, for all life is a gift which we Starting at the beginning of this church year, we've introduced something new to our worship, and that is to invite members of this community to record short videos introducing the offering and sharing some of what this church means to them. On this morning, um, we'll be hearing from board member Tim Voss and his partner, Katie. Greetings, it's good to be with you. I'm Tim Voss and my wife Katie and I would like to share a little bit about what UUC means to us and why we give. We're so grateful to be part of UUC. We feel appreciative of the opportunity to feel a part of something that is much larger than ourselves. There is such a legacy of service and inspiration and we just know that it's beyond the scale of what we could do or be as individuals and as a family. Over the years, we've benefited from the programs of the church in many ways. We've um, participated in music, which is so grounding and amazing, and relig religious education. And we've been inspired by many, many a service. But I think the biggest reason we give and appreciate our connection is the idea that we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves. I'll, I'll add to that. It hasn't always been easy to feel connected uh, at UUC. And uh, what I discovered, though, during those times is that I, um, the power to connect often began with me. Uh, the more I put myself out there, the more I um, gave, the more I allowed myself to feel vulnerable, even with finances. I found that uh, the more connected I felt. Join us to say the words of the offertory. This, this church, church is, is a community, community of ourselves. ourselves. Its, its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its, its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we, we affirm our lives within it. Blue and blue, 
As we move into this moment of prayer and meditation, I invite you to start following your breath. Following your breath. And settling into your body. At this moment in time. And I offer you this meditation from the Reverend Nathan Walker. Breathing in, I am aware of my pain. Breathing out, I am aware that I am not my pain. Breathing in, I am aware of my past. Breathing out, I am aware that I am not my past. Breathing in, I am aware of my anger. Breathing out, I am aware that I am not my anger. Breathing in, I am aware of my despair. Breathing out, I am aware that I am not my despair. Breathing in, I am aware of peace. Breathing out, I am aware that I am worthy of peace. Breathing in, I am aware of love. Breathing out, I am aware that I am worthy of love. Breathing in, I am aware of joy. Breathing out, I am aware I am worthy of joy. Breathing in, I am aware of hope. Breathing out, I am aware that I am an agent of hope. Breathing in, I am aware.
peace and blessings. Amen. This morning we will celebrate a very special anniversary in our Unitarian Universalist heritage. So I have chosen as our second hymn an old Universalist hymn, literally about 200 years old, which used to be sung in the Universalist churches in America for probably up to about a century. It is set to a hymn tune we have not sung before in this church, so I'm not sure that most of you will, may be able to sing along. And when you see the words, there may be some surprise, of course, to the language that was so meaningful to our universalist forebears so long ago. One of our affiliated ministers here at University Unitarian Church, Marvin Evans, gave a sermon years ago in which he said, to be a Unitarian Universalist requires that one engage in simultaneous translation regularly. So I'm going to invite you to be imaginative as you at least look at the words and listen to those of us who sing the hymn our second hymn. Display with all your speed. 
I'm going to uh, thank you after the fact for being a good sport this morning. He was a lay preacher from Great Britain. A lay preacher meaning he never went to seminary. He was the most widely known and respected voice of American universalism in the last half of the 18th century. He alone was responsible for uniting all of the universalist churches on the eastern seaboard into one denomination, and he served as the connective tissue beyond for all of those congregations. He was a personal friend of George Washington, and he had the great good fortune of marrying Judith Sargent, who was the first feminist in America advocating for extending education for all women and improving their social conditions. She was the first female playwright to have a play performed in the city of Boston long, long ago, a remarkable, truly human being. And finally, he was revered as the saintly founder of universalism. His name was John Murray. He was born in the village of Alton in Hampshire, England, in 1741, and he was the oldest of nine children. His parents were staunch Anglicans and very, very strict, particularly his father, who some historians now think was abusive of all of the children, especially the oldest son. His mother also put the fear, literally the fear of God, into all of the children when they were very young. When he was 10 years old, the family moved to Cork, Ireland. And when they were there, they converted to Methodism, which was still at the time a part of the Anglican Church in England, but it was the evangelical part of the Anglican Church. His father died when he was 15 years of age, and he became the family breadwinner at that point. Think of it now, eight siblings and a mother. And he never liked any of the jobs that he had to have in order to support the family, but he certainly did his duty. He was always intrigued by religious topics and soon left business to become a traveling evangelist which was the Methodist custom at the time in the British Isles. During one of these visits, he came across George Whitfield, who was perhaps the premier Protestant evangelist in Great Britain and also in the United States in the middle of the 18th century. George Whitfield, also unschooled, would draw crowds of thousands of thousands of people in fields and in tents, uh, bringing conversions uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ right there in front uh, of all the masses of folks. Murray decided then, after his conversion, to move to the city of London for greater opportunity. And when he was only 19 years old, he married Eliza Neal, who was very quickly disinherited by her grandfather, who was quite wealthy, because he considered that she married far below her station in life, and he would not support such a gesture. So he disinherited her. About this time, though, this young couple, about 19, 18, 20 years old, became interested in the writings of a Welsh Methodist named James Relly. James Relly was also a traveling evangelist, and one of the doctrines that he preached was the doctrine of universal salvation, which meant that at the end time, all human beings would be saved, even those who didn't believe in God, even those who were sinful in the eyes of others, because God was a God of love and forgiveness, not a fearsome, harsh, and punitive God, but a God of acceptance and welcome and love. Relly said, quote, because every 
human being is part of the mystical union of the body of Christ, no person could ever be lost. Close quote. This message to the young Murray was electric, and he and his wife became followers of James Relly and continued to preach this radical, heretical view at that time in England. As a matter of fact, they embraced it so deeply that the church they were members of at the time, a Methodist church, excommunicated them for their heretical teachings and threw them out. And if that wasn't bad enough, John Murray's life took an even greater turn for the worse. First, his infant son died after four months of life, and his wife quickly followed. He spent all the money he had in their medical care and even spent beyond what he had for their medical care. He lost them both. He was thrown in debtor's prison where he had to survive in squalid conditions for many months until his brother-in-law rescued him by paying his debt. Murray then endeavored to repay his brother-in-law what was given on his behalf. But the tragedies didn't end then. Within a succession of one year, Murray lost four of his siblings, and he fell into a very great depression. During that time, he endeavored to lose his life, as he said, to leave England and to sail for America, where he said, quote, I wish to lose myself entirely in a new land. So in 1770, at the age of 28, now alone, no family with him, he decided to sail for New York to lose his life. And on September the 30th, 250 years ago, last Wednesday, he arrived in the New World, but not in New York. A storm put the ship off course and they landed on the southern coast of New Jersey, where the ship got grounded on a sandbar. The captain of the ship invited some of those who were sailing with him to go ashore for the purchase of some additional supplies as they waited the winds to change and move the ship off the sandbar. And Murray was among those few who went ashore. And when he did, he met a man called Thomas Potter, who owned the land there adjacent to the beach. Now, Thomas Potter, amazingly enough, was also one of these evangelical believers who built on his farm property a chapel. He promised God that he would build a chapel on his land if God would provide a preacher. And John Murray was the answer to his prayer. Now, this wasn't Murray's idea of why he had come to the United States, and he found himself in a difficult situation. So he made a deal with Thomas Potter and said, if in the next few days the winds do not change and the ship remains stuck off the coast, then I will stay and be your preacher. But if the ship moves, I'll be on it. We'll be heading back to New York, and I won't do it. And the winds never changed, and Thomas Potter was delighted to welcome John Murray as the first preacher in that chapel of universal salvation. 
That site is now Murray Grove in New Jersey, which is a Unitarian Universalist camp and conference center. That's a pretty tremendous story, and it's mostly true. But like all founding myths, it's a lovely story. So of course, it's all true. But Murray did begin preaching there and preaching in the vicinity and started going up and down the coast, eastern coast, up into New England and New York, preaching his message of universal salvation. In some places, it met with eager response, positive response, and in other places, he was chased out of town as a heretic, as an infidel, as a traitor to the Christian message. In 1774, he found himself preaching in the city of Boston, and one of the listeners in his audience was a man named Winthrop Sargent, who was a very successful businessman from the city of Gloucester, which is north of Boston and has been known for its whole history, for its great fishing fleet. The great fishing fleet on the, of cod on the Great Banks off of the coast of the uh, Maritime Provinces and New England had its center in the city of Gloucester. And here was Winthrop Sargent sitting in that audience in Boston listening to James Murray and hearing in his preaching James Relly's message, which absolutely surprised him because Sargent was a member of a small group in the city of Gloucester who also had been studying James Relly's writings. And so Winthrop Sargent invited John Murray to come to Gloucester to preach and to stay with them as their minister. He wasn't quite sure he wanted to do this, but during this time he befriended George Washington, who asked him to become a chaplain for the American army during the Revolutionary War. Some of the other chaplains didn't like Murray because his views were way too radical, way too liberal for them, and they petitioned General Washington to release John Murray from his duties as a preacher, and George Washington refused to do so. So Murray had the patronage of a very powerful and influential person, continued in his chaplaincy work for nine months until he contracted dysentery, had to leave the army and go back into civilian life. He went, however, to Gloucester, Massachusetts, and he helped found in that city in 1779 a church called the Independent Christian Church. It's really the first universalist church in the United States. Still exists, still is active, still functions. But just the year before that, as he was in Gloucester, he fell in love a second time with the daughter of Winthrop Sargent, Judith Sargent, who had been recently widowed. She had attended his sermons when he preached in Gloucester, loved very much what she was hearing, and wanted to share the rest of her life with him as he did with her. And a more fortuitous match could never have been made. As I mentioned earlier, she was a most remarkable person, a woman of very high literary gifts, a prolific writer, journals, letters, essays, some of which have only recently been found in Mississippi, of all places. She was perhaps America's first feminist, but she was also an ardent defender of her husband, and after his death was his literary executor. And without that, we would not have known as much about John Murray as we would have otherwise. 
Over the next 20 years, from this point on, John Murray traveled up and down the eastern seaboard, helping to found and support Universalist churches all the way from Maine down to South Carolina. But in 1794, at the age of 53, he received an invitation to become the minister of the First Universalist Church in Boston, Massachusetts. This was quite a prestigious location, a large urban church, and he became, once he accepted the offer, a kind of bishop for the Universalist denomination, and he was for a long time the public face of Universalism in America. He continued to preach and serve that church until the end of his days. In 1809, however, at the age of 68, he suffered a severe stroke and was partially paralyzed. His congregation, however, so loved and revered him that they carried him in to the sanctuary each Sunday on a chair and placed it in the pulpit so they could hear his preaching and his message of salvation for all people. Of course, with time, it became difficult for him to exercise all the duties of a minister, and the church began to look for an associate who would help him. He died in 1815, and he is now buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And when we have taken our every other year pilgrimage to New England to visit historic sites, we do go to Mount Auburn Cemetery and we do stop at the gravestone of John Murray, who was the father of American universalism. John Murray believed that all who died unrepentant would be punished in the afterlife until the very last judgment when every human being would then be able to see his or her name inscribed in the book of life. While he is revered as the founder of universalism, his personal interpretation of what universal salvation meant was challenged even in his own day. It sounds so Unitarian Universalist to say that, that whatever the preacher may be saying, there are at least 73 other variations on a theme if you listen to the members during the coffee hour. This is true, too, of John Murray that made it difficult for him to find an associate who would be sympathetic to his own views. His life was marked by much hardship and tragedy. There was much chance misfortune as well as chance good fortune in his life. And yet, despite this trajectory, was able to embody literally embody his firm belief in God's love for all human beings and our ultimate universal reclamation at the end of time. 250 years ago last Wednesday, this man arrived on the coast of New Jersey and we have, for all this time, considered that the beginning of universalism as an organized faith in the United States. But what does it mean today, 250 years later? As I quoted earlier in the sermon, James Reilly said, quote, because we are all part of a mystical union, no one can be lost, close quote. 
it's pretty obvious that the theology of John Murray's time, the early and middle 18th, 19th centuries, does not speak to us today in the same way that it did for so many hundreds of thousands of people in the United States in its long history. Remember that competing interpretations were extant even in his own time, and the notion of universalism actually goes back to the fourth century in Asia Minor with one of the early church fathers who was condemned as a heretic for believing in universal salvation. It's an old, old idea, and yet institutionalized only in the modern period. But Relly's claim, the claim that all of us are part of a mystical union, thereby no one can get lost, I think contains an insight that has continued to be meaningful for us on two fronts. The first part of that phrase, that all of us are part of a mystical union, suggests what we would call today the notion of interdependence or the network of mutuality, as Martin Luther King Jr. called it, or the matrix of being, as some other theologians have called it, or we might know it as the web of creation. Interlocking dependencies in a total system, all of us related to all of these pieces together, and none can really ever be lost from this. And the second part of it is that point. No one can be lost. How is that possible? Well, for John Murray, he believed that it was God's love that held the matrix of life together. Universalism's main contribution in American religious life has been that it has given us a very different understanding of what God is or God has been, a benevolent God, a loving God. The universalists believed in the sinfulness of humankind, but the one thing that overcame that was this profound love that was given to us, unmerited, you see. I think that love is still central in this equation. And let me give you one example. We all live as dependent creatures in a natural system. When we disrespect or violate that dependency, we pay a price for that disrespect. But we also at the same time have an opportunity to repair the breach that has happened. I think that the climate crisis we face today is the perfect illustration of these claims. We are dependent upon the earth. When we violate that relationship, we pay a price and we have an opportunity to repair the harm that we have done. The most profound motivator to work for justice, or as Judaism calls it, the repair of the world, tikkun olam, the most profound motivator comes from the experience that something we love more than anything else has been violated. We love the earth, and yet we violate the earth. We attempt to repair the breach. We love other people. Other people are violated, disrespected, and we attempt to repair the breach. Indeed, from this we might go 
so far even to say that when we do not love the earth, when we do not love other people sufficiently, we are unmotivated to repair the harm that we unwittingly and maybe even unconsciously support. Love is the foundation of justice in a world where our lives are woven inescapably with the lives of all other people. And so you see, an old understanding of universalism has evolved to a new understanding of universalism. In the last years of Murray's ministry, he had to contend both with members and other competing leaders who had different understandings of universal salvation than he did. And one of those persons was Hosea Balu, who decided to keep a low profile as long as John Murray lived so that Murray could end his days known and revered as the first great leader of universalism in America. Ballou was to become the second great leader right after Murray died. Perhaps his willingness to put himself aside was an act of love too. It demonstrated such sensitivity and understanding and reverence for another fragile, imperfect, and wondrous human being. May we do likewise. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 174, O Earth, You Are Surpassing Fair.
The closing words this morning are attributed to John Murray, who said, Go out into the highways and byways. Give the people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it. Let it shine. Use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of women and men. Give them not hell, but hope and courage and preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. So may it be. Amen. Wenn ich früh in den Garten gehe, in meinem grünen Hut, ist mein erster Gedanke, was nun mein Liebster tut. Am Himmel steht kein Stern, denn ich den Preis nicht hinte. Mein Herz gebe ich im Kern, wenn ich's heraustun könnte. Wenn ich früh in den Garten gehe,